Thank you all. Uh, <clears throat> in the last uh, round of questioning, I asked a question of uh, our first witness. What percentage of people who fail a background check actually uh, get prosecuted? And I should have asked actually get convicted because it's even less. So you can check our math, but he said there were about 80,000 background checks and some of them are false positive, a small number, so that would definitely affect the numbers, but not a whole lot. There were 44 people prosecuted. I don't know exactly how many were convicted, but in 2010, there were 76,142 FBI denials referred to ATF. There were 62 charges referred for prosecution and 13 resulted in a guilty plea. But when you do the math, it's 55 100 thousandths of a percent. And that gets to be where I really can't put my arms around it. So the point I guess I'm trying to make to the committee and the public at large, if you expand background checks and no one ever suffers the consequences of lying or making a straw purchase, I don't think it's gonna do much good. Uh, Professor Tribe, do you agree with the concept that people to obey the law, they have to fear that there will be a consequence if they break it? I certainly do, and I think that the fear of a really serious consequence rather than a slap on the wrist would make a difference. But the key point to me um, is that when you have so many loopholes so that somebody who thinks he's going to flunk a background check unless he lies goes to a gun show or buys on the Internet, of course the system of background checks is not going to work. It works only better. It works better the more universal you make it. Well, why don't we... Why don't, well, will you agree that criminals <clears throat> universally will try to get a gun outside the law? And they'll try to violate the law in every way. A absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. So it's never really universal. It's really about law-abiding citizens, what we expect of them. And I guess my point is, this number to me is startling. I think if you're looking for some common ground, uh, Mr. Cooper, it seems to be this would be a good place to start. Uh, try to find, if it's a resource problem, let's dedicate some money. If it's an attitude problem, let's adjust attitudes. But in, in all honesty to the panel, I don't think any expansion of background checks is going to be a deterrent until somebody in a real way suffers the consequences under the current system. So when you say people fall through the cracks, I would say there is a, a hole a mile wide in the current system. I mean, it is just a floodgate that your chance of being prosecuted for violating a background check or providing false information is probably a lot less than being struck by lightning or hit by a meteor. But so that, I don't know what those numbers are, but I would say let's focus on that. Now, Dr. Tribe, um, when it comes to uh, uh, defining what the, the, uh, the constitutional parameters uh, of what you can do up here to regulate gun ownership, one is common usage over two other Right. The two others, Senator Graham, thank you for, for giving me a chance to get to them, uh, were the degree of unusual dangerousness, and that was not simply another way of saying common use. That is, right. of course, all guns are dangerous or they would be useless, but a gun that can spray bullets without being reloaded is more dangerous. Uh, and the third criterion was how vital it is to self-defense. Now, none of those things can be answered in a kind of easy black and white way, because in a sense, the more dangerous a gun is, uh, the more useful it also is for self-defense. Well, let, let's, that, that's a good point, and I, I guess that's what I'm trying to tell the public. Could you put our chart up about the different guns? Do we have them? Uh, Ms. Hupp, am I pronouncing your name right? I think we all agree that any weapon, one bullet in the hands of a mentally unstable person is one too many. Do you all agree with that concept? Any gun should be denied someone who's mentally unstable. Yes. Okay, and I think everybody would. And we don't want felons because that's already the existing law. Now, a, a circumstance you've described very eloquently, the circumstance you found yourself in, Ms. Hump, but there's a case in Atlanta recently, Dr. Tribe, of a lady who was defending her home against a home invader. She was home with twin daughters, nine years old. She ran up to the uh, closet, hid in the closet, 
she was on the phone to her husband. The guy followed up the steps, broke into the closet. She had a six-shot revolver. She emptied the gun, hit him five of six times, and he was a 38 revolver. He was still able to get up and drive away. And I've been told that one-third of all attacks involve more than two people. So is it unfair for Congress to say that in the hands of a mother defending her children against a home invader, six rounds may not be enough, 10 rounds may not be enough. In that situation, I wish you would had 15 or more because six rounds were not able to do the job. Does that make sense to you how I could think that way? Well, it makes a certain kind of sense, Senator Graham, but it, it's an argument that has no limit because if she had a machine gun, she might have been even safer. Or if she had, uh, you know, if she had a hand grenade, but, better still, blow them all out right, of the water. But, but here's where democracy works. I don't want her to have a machine gun or a hand grenade. Mm -hmm. I just don't want her to be limited to 10 bullets when the re real world, everything's a balance. She may need more than 10 and the uh, mentally unstable person doesn't need more than one. Now the second w series of weapons, after natural disasters, you've had mobs roam around uh, areas that are lawless. Basically there's no power, the police can't get there. Katrina, Sandy, Haiti, you name it. That you got three homes. One home, the homeowner has no gun. The second home has a shotgun. The third home, they have an AR-15. Mr. Cooper, what home do you think would be best protected? I'd rather be in the uh, home that has the AR-15, uh, Senator Graham, but uh, the shotgun would come in very handy as well. Um, and I and I think that uh, your comments about the Atlanta episode really bring into very sharp focus why this uh, magazine ban is so uh, misguided in addition to there being There are over 4 million high-capacity magazines out on the market, right? There are, and, there's st and, and, and criminals are likely to get them no matter what we do up here. They will undoubtedly get and them. And the only person that could be really affected is the law-abiding person who could be limited. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, we can have great disagreements about how far the Second Amendment goes, and there are limits, just like freedom of speech. So I just hope the committee will understand a good <clears throat> place to start, Mr. Chairman, is taking the laws we have and bring about a sense of you better not violate that law because something bad will happen to you. And when you're at 55 of one one hundred thousandths in prosecution, we've got a ways to go. Thank you all. This has been a Sunfish production.